So we're in a series which we call Chapters here at Ramp Church. This next chapter of the life of Ramp Church is about the Great Commission. Who's familiar with the Great Commission? Have you heard that phrase before? Great Commission. So I'm about to read it to you, but it, it is at the end of Jesus' time here on earth, physically, he gives a commission to his followers. And the commission is, um, isn't the, the, the end of his ministry. In many ways, it is the beginning. And we're going we're gonna to dive into that in the days to come. But I, my belief is that the greatest way to understand the Great Commission is to look at the way the people who heard it from Jesus' mouth responded to it. So, you know, there's different ways to interpret um, everything that's said, right? Just ask my kids when I ask them to do something. There's different ways to understand, to interpret what's said, right? There's different ways to twist it, to bend it. To, well, you've got it. So that means we have, to, we have to make sure we have a right interpretation of, on what's said to us. So when you look at the lives of the people who responded to the Great Commission, that's our starting point for understanding what Jesus really meant. So let's, let's turn to Matthew 28, and then after we read this together, I will get into... Into my message. Matthew chapter 28, very popular few verses. Um, We're going to read verses 16 through 20. 16 through 20. Here's what it says. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. Now they were in Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem's about 40 miles south of Galilee. So um, Jesus just got crucified and then he he was resurrected from the dead. So some pretty wild events (laughs) just happened. And then he tells them, meet me in Galilee. So they they take two or three day journey up to Galilee. And and that's where this story picks up. To the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Isn't that wild that they put that in there in the story? Some doubted. If if you're today struggling with doubt, there's, there's room around the table for you. Um, actually, I think this is probably the best table for you to be at if, if you're struggling with doubt. Maybe you're exploring faith. Maybe you're a person of faith. Um, but it, the, the doubting ones weren't some marginal people. They were, the, they were part of the 11. It, it, and this is actually one of the things that historians say um, make this, this eyewitness account reliable. And when, with, when historians look at an ancient document and they're trying to judge its reliability, they're looking for certain clues that would tell them it's reliable. And this is one of the things, because the writers of this, if they were making stories up about their own journey, about Jesus' journey, they would have never said, well, we doubted. Right? If I'm writing my own story, no, I mean, I'm going to be a little better looking than that. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? They would never say, if they're fabricating a story, the last thing they're going to say is, we were the guys who didn't believe it. Right? They're going to say, we were the guys who believed it when nobody else did. So this is actually a sign of authenticity for this eyewitness account, which is really cool. That's, that's all. That was, a, that was free, guys. That was a side note. So, um, so they, they went to the, the mountain Jesus directed them to. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And if, if, if you want the, the, the Great Commission in a few words, here it is. Go, say go. go. Therefore, and make, say make. Disciples of all nations, baptizing. All right, you're getting good. You're getting good at this. Them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. The Great Commission is essentially going, making, baptizing, and teaching. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is Jesus' commandment. We then see when we go into Acts, um, it's amazing because the Luke who wrote one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus, then writes the history of the church. That's called the book of Acts. And can I just give you some homework, Ramp Church family? For the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of this for the next six weeks, okay? Um, Dive into the book of Acts. Can I give you that homework? Just just start reading through the book of Acts. It's a really great read if you've never read it because it's it's story form. It's, It's talking about... Um, the, the way people's lives are unfolding. And roughly every 10 chapters is about 10 years. So that, that's just a neat guideline as you're reading through the book. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great book to read. But what is it? Why are we reading it? Because it is the way Jesus' earliest followers responded to what we just read. They hear this 
And then they decide, well, what am I going to do about that? And so th that's why it's hugely important for us. But at the beginning of Luke's, Luke writing Acts, he wrote Acts, he says this. Um, he said, all that in my last account about Jesus' life, all that Jesus began to do and teach, such a key verse. Because in our mind, that was, Je that was the totality of Jesus' life. But in earlier disciples' minds, that was just the beginning. And Jesus leaving and now leaving his mandate, his commission with the church, that's really where the work begins. And so that's what we're going to dive into. This is the title of today's message. The fight for your life's direction. The fight for your life's direction. See, all of us, our lives are shaped around something. We're heading in a certain direction, whether intentionally or unintentionally, you are moving somewhere. That there is a, there is an end to your actions and your decisions, to your commitments. There is there is an end to the road you're on. Does that make sense? Um, the simple fact that 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 is true should make us then review the direction we're headed, and whatever direction you're headed, there's going to be resistance. And we're going to talk about that. But I love this quote from Andy Stanley. This is, this is a great principle because this is where we're at in this, this chapter, this teaching series at Ramp Church. Look at this quote. Your direction, not your intention, determines your destination. Your direction, not your intention, des de determines your destination. Isn't that, an interesting, isn't that an interesting principle? The reality is it doesn't matter how much you want something. If you're headed a different direction, you'll never get it. You could want it with all your guts. You get, oh, I really, mm. but if you're on a different path, then you're not going to find the thing that you're ultimately wanting. That's, that's, that's what Andy Stanley's trying to get at here. And much of our, this series, this chapter so far, has been talking about intention. So I'm not trying to divorce your direction from intention. You, you got to have right intentions. <laughs> it matters. I spoke two weeks about love and the, the, the way the love of God marries the Great Commission in our lives. So what's motivating you is incredibly important. And if you myth, missed or miffed, I don't know, missed those messages, maybe go back and, and, and listen. That was a few weeks ago. And then Stacy last week dropped a bomb on the room. Anybody here for that? Um, and she, she talked about what, what is ultimately, what is our commitment to the, great commi to, to the Great Commission? Are we deep down committed to this, willing to shape our lives? That's motivation. That's intention. But something happens when Jesus gives the Great Commission. He'd spent three years with the disciples tweaking their internal worlds, okay? Showing them where, where, where do you live from? Where's the source of your life? How do we find that place that God's called us to on the inside? Then he gives a great commission, and he's not asking them to go think about loving thoughts. He's not asking them to go just imagine how much you think the world is a good place. He's asking them to change their direction. That makes sense. He's shifting from purely an internal world, or not purely, but maybe primarily. He wants to see a directional shift out of their life. And, and I, I, wanna, I wanna just want to, to extend that invitation to you, Ramp Church. I want to extend this shift in our lives that we're not seeing our lives purely from what's happening on the inside. But we're looking at what's happening on the outside, and I'm willing to change direction based on what I feel like God's saying to me. Are you signed up for that journey? Are you awake this morning? So God's asking something from us. How are we going to respond to what he's asking? So we're, we're going to look at the Great Commission. We're going to look at the lives of the people who heard it straight from Jesus. There's six different things we're looking at. Six different things from the book of Acts. They waited on God through prayer and fasting. They loved each other through hospitality and generosity. They unified in gatherings, large and small. They served the needy with time and money. They cultivated favor with the city around them. And then they pioneered new churches where God led them. So we're going to spend a few weeks. Next week, James Aladdin. One of my favorite teachers and preachers is going to speak to us on how they waited on God through prayer and fasting. If, you've, if you're wondering about prayer and fasting, if it's something you've never done yourself, or maybe it is something you've done before, but I want to know more about this, come next week. Um, because James is, going to, James is going to lead us and speak to us on that topic. So, here's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Four critical questions about your life's direction. 
four critical questions about your life's direction. This is, I'm going to teach a bit. So this is a very teachy kind of a thing. So I hope you brought your notepad if you didn't just use your shirt sleeve or something. Um, it's, worth, it's worth taking notes on. Four critical questions about your life's direction. And I, I just want to say this. If you're not a person of faith, and this is for those of you watching online as well, you need to answer these questions too. Because these answers are not just, uh, they don't just teach us, they're reflective in nature. So when you answer this question, if you don't have a sufficient answer, you may want to find a sufficient answer. You may want to change your direction because the point of this question is not, is not just to change my actions, but it is, it, it is to reflect and make sure the path I'm on is the right one. This is the first question that's critical for you to ask, and in many ways it's foundational. It's this. What story am I living? What story am I living? Everybody's living a story. I, I like to think that I'm more rational than that, that actually my life is built on these pillars of very clear belief systems and, and um, uh, this logical way and very practical or pragmatic way to do life. But in many ways, I'm actually living out a story, a story about what's important, what's valuable, uh, a story about what's, what's right, what's good, what's beautiful. I'm pursuing those things, and I'm avoiding things that, that pull me from that. And those stories that I tell about my, my past, my parents, w- w- what, I, what I enjoy, what I want to avoid, those stories shape everything else. This, I, this is review for many of you, but it's, it's that important for us to revisit this. And this matters for several reasons. One of the reasons is that the story we're living shapes our value system. Say value system. And often the reason we have trouble finding traction in the story of God is because we're importing values that aren't God's values into the story of God. We're trying to live that out. And then there's discontinuity There's b- between that. I'll give you an example. When Stacy and I were looking... Um, at moving to the UK, um, we there was a lot of things leading up to that, of course. So for us, that was about a 12-year journey. People ask about, well, you know, tell me about the ramp. Why'd the ramp come to Manchester? That's a different story. You can come to our new here class, which is happening in October, um, to find out more about that. But for us, that was a 12-year journey in the making. Lots of words, trips here to Manchester, and God leading us. But at the at the end of the day, it had to come to some action. So we put our house on the market. We sell our cars. We you know, we sell most of our stuff. You know, all the, it, it, there's a lot of activity around that. There's some people who are very close to us in our lives who are Christians. So you would think that there would be like a common understanding on, man, we're going because we feel like God's said he wants to do something incredible in Manchester. And we want to be a part of, of that. There's already incredible stuff happening, but we want to join what God's doing. Um, but people very close to us were not into that. They actually didn't understand the level of sacrifice or inconvenience. And they they couldn't see how following God would actually require something like that. And they're Christians. So we, we had resistance to that. And I found it hard to explain because I thought there was common ground. But somewhere along the way, they had brought a value system in, into the kingdom... That wasn't Jesus thinking. So their value system said something like, well, um, you're going to make less money. That can't be God. It's going to be uncomfortable. That can't be God. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to separate you, the kids from the grandparents. That can't be God. You don't really know what, if it's even going to be successful. That can't be God. And then all of a sudden, as from an American perspective, you go, well, those, those things sound a lot like the American dream. <laughs> so are you actually reviewing what story are you asking me to live? Is it the American dream with Jesus language? Or is it the kingdom story, the story God's writing through your life? And why it's incredibly important for you to understand what story you're living is because you're going you're gonna to live based out of a value system. And if you don't know what it is, that means you're living out of one and you don't even know it. You're hearing me? This is why before Jesus would give a great commission, he just asked, he just asked those, those 12 dudes and 
70 others and a couple other. Just spend three and a half years with me. We're not even going to, I'm not going to talk about church structure. I'm not going to talk about policies and procedures and church governance and your new membership program and the marketing that you're going to do after I leave. I mean, he didn't do any of that stuff that we would do if we were about to leave a business or, a, or, a, or an inheritance or something structural, a command with somebody. What did he do? Just be with me. Why was that the starting point? Because he knew if you live life with me for three and a half years, you're going to catch my values. You're going to reprogram all of those things that you think are important, important, that you're actually living out of, that you're unaware of. You're going to reprogram those things. And when somebody, at, then when I speak to you a command, move or go, change careers, speak to them, you're not interpreting that through a different value system because you know the story you're living. Can I just show, there, there's, there's hundreds, but I just want to show you a few things God values that are countercultural. Let's look at these. God values responsibility over comfort. He values love over control, impact over image, commitment over freedom, obedience over sacrifice, integrity over results, authenticity over influence. See, and when we get those things reversed, we may be stepping into the kingdom and using kingdom language and making kingdom decisions sometimes, but if we're living out of the wrong value system, we're going to be living the wrong story. You hearing me? That's why it's important for you to get in this word and stay in this word. Even and especially when you don't understand it. Can I tell you, I've, I've been to university to study this. I, I read it every day. I'm, I, I prepare messages. There, most of this I don't understand. So if understanding was the prerequisite for reading, all of us would be lost causes. The point is you get in it and you allow it to change you. You allow it to remind you the story that God wants to write through your life. Some days when I wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you know what I'm saying. And it's like I just see one of my kids or something and it's like, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm angsty. You know, it's like they can't do anything right. And I just think about my work day. I'm like, why, why am I here? What do I, you know, that kind of day. I can open up, I can open up this word. And it's like I start reading and all of a sudden what happened? It's not like some truth. just It's like the story of God starts to blow up inside my heart. And I realize, whoa, whoa, those, those things I was worrying about, those are too earthly for me, right? There's a transcendent story that God's called me to be a part of. How does your life's direction fit into God's story? How does your life's direction fit into God's story? Do you realize this is not a small question to answer? Eternity is at stake. Sorry to make things really heavy this morning. Eternity is at stake. We can, but I, I wouldn't be a good leader. I, would, I wouldn't be a good teacher if, it, it, uh, of this word if I didn't bring this to your attention. If I, 20 years from now, and we're having a meeting like this, if, if I couldn't look back over the, tw the previous 20 years and go, at some point, I challenge them going, your life's direction matters. Not just what you believe, where you're headed, how you shape your decisions and your career, how you shape your finances. The story you're living matters. And I promise, on your deathbed, that's what you're going to be thinking about. What story did I live? Not how many likes were on that Instagram post you did yesterday. I know that was the first thing you thought about this morning when you woke up. <laughs> you will not be thinking about that in the future. The story you're living shapes your values, and your values shape your life. You're hearing me. That's the first question in your life. It's the first critical question when you're looking at your life's direction. What story am I living in? And you're probably wondering, well, what is the kingdom story? That's where we're going to spend the next six weeks unpacking. What is the kingdom story then? How do I live this? Good. I'm glad you want to know more. Come back. Come back. Number one, what story am I living? The second question you need to, to ask is this. What gifts am I giving? What story am I living? What gifts am I giving? You are put here 
to give something that the world doesn't have without you. You hearing me? You're put here to give something the world doesn't have without you. Uh, this is what 1 Corinthians 12 says. I love this verse. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities. Paul's putting all those on a parallel. That's why the language looks like it does. Gifts, service, activities. But it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone to each is given. Say, I'm an each. (laughs) Not a leech, an each. Everyone is given, look at this. Manifestation of God's spirit for the common good. Every person in here. This is what that means. If you're not fully living in the gifts that God has given you, there is a manifestation of God that we're not experiencing. Because to each has been given a manifestation of the spirit of God. The Bible would go on to say, we know in and we prophesy in, me included. I'm not the chief Christian officer around here, whatever that is. I just made that up. CEO, chief Christian officer. That's not me. It's not like I am all the gifts in one. Look at me. Come in Sunday and watch me be all the gifts. No, that's, that's, I'm, I'm just one dude and I have a role here. But I know in part and I prophesy in part. Do you know who has the other parts? Say me. Yeah, good good answer. That was the right answer. You have the other parts. The varieties of God's gifts and service and activities are put inside of you. Um, Your unique section of the world, I don't have access to. I don't like book slots to come save your friends, right? Book a slot with Joe. Come come witness to my friend. That's that's not me. You have influence there. God's given you access to that space of society and cultural land. You have gifts to give. And it's a manifestation of God's spirit. You wonder where God is. Where, Where is God in my workplace? Well, when you showed up, that's where he is. I can't see God anywhere there. Well, if you're there to see it, he's already there because he's in you. And what does he want to do? He wants to manifest himself through you, through through different things, your behavior, your tone of voice, your responses, your outlooks. You hear me? You're pulling, you're calling to the deep inside of somebody else. You're reminding them there is something more to live for. You're reminding them that they are more than the life they're choosing. God is speaking through you. That's why the New Testament would call you an ambassador. You are coming from a different land, reminding, calling to the deep in somebody else going, eternity is in your heart because there is an author who wants to speak to you. You are God's ambassador. What gifts am I giving? Your gifts manifest God's goodness to others. Isn't that incredible? I know it's simple, but don't lose the profound truth in the simplicity. Your gifts manifest God's goodness to others. That's why you've been placed in their life. Do you know 1 Corinthians 12 is all about spiritual gifts, right? Do you know what 1 Corinthians 13 is about? You know, love. Why would God partner those two things together? Well, because gifts are not about ministry influence. They're not about being insta-famous or having a big church. That's not, spiritual gifts are about love, loving well. God knows to love well, I've got to be able to bring solutions to people's problems. And bring solutions to people's problems, I've got to have a gift. So to bring a solution to someone's problem, God grants me a gift, and then I come into their life and I bring that gift. That's God's solution to their problem. That's God's goodness manifest in their life. I'm there to bring that. And that, that, get, get in tune with the gifts in, 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 the, in the New Testament. They're not all spiritual or, or, or um, spectacular. It's not all prophecy, right? Administration is a gift. You wouldn't be here in this building if administration was a gift, and it's not mine. So 
You can applaud. Anybody who you see straightening a, ch- a line of chairs. Gifts manifest God's goodness to others. That's the second question. What gifts am I giving? The third question you need to answer is this. What enemies am I fighting? What enemies am I fighting? There are enemies in your world. Anytime you start on a direction, you're going to fight something. If in your life, the purpose of your life is to avoid opposition, you're not living, in, you're not living intentionally. You haven't cho- chosen the direction. You're living reactively. You hearing me? When as soon as I bump an opposition, oh man, that's not the right way to go. Bump an opposition, that's not the right way to go. Does that make sense? That now you're living reactively. Any direction you choose, there will be opposition. You better make sure it's the right opposition. You better make sure it's the right enemy. I, t- I tell my staff this all the time when we start getting into certain solutions or for where we're going to have services or when we're going to open a registration. I, and we go, man, there's a lot of problems with this. And I go, I don't, I don't have a problem with problems. I just want to make sure they're the right problems. Because if we solve the wrong problem, it's the, it's the wrong solution. <laughs> Let's pick the right problems in life to solve. You're going to have opposition. Make sure it's taking you the right direction. You hearing me? What enemies am I fighting? I love this in James. Chapter number one. This is one of, my, one of my favorite verses. This is what James says. Count, say count, it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, that you may be perfect and complete, or mature is another word for that word perfect, lacking nothing. That's a pretty big promise. Count it joy. How, how, do I, how am I perfect and complete, lacking nothing? Count it all joy when I face trials. I love that. I love that James used the word count. I think of like an accounting phrase. Count. Any accountants in the room or bookkeepers? You know when you categorize something? You have all these expenses and, and you categorize it. What James is saying is categorize it as joy. I know that's a trial. You categorize it as joy. What is he saying? Cook the books. Count it as joy so that when you reflect over your day or your week, that's not in the trial category. That's in the joy category. When you look back over your day and you go, man, that was a joy. That was a joy. That one employee, they're a joy. That one team member at work, they are a joy. You're tracking with me. My sister, she is a joy. <laughs> Woo! She's a joy. Count it. Joy, he's talking about framing. When you look at your life, what do you see? How do you count it? With a kingdom perspective, the trial becomes joy. That's how I count it. It doesn't mean I'm like brainwashing myself into this. I realize that in the purpose, in the pain, there is purpose. That's what I realize. I realized this. I had this next principle. This is what I want to teach you right here. When you're living God's story, hardship, pain, and suffering become resistance, not defeat. Did you hear me? They don't define me. They develop me. This is the difference when you're living God's story and an enemy comes along They're not signaling my defeat. They're signaling what what area is God wanting to develop me in. You've got to understand this. If you're living God's story, this is critical. Joseph, in the Bible, faced false accusations. David faced life-threatening envy. Daniel faced political oppression. Jesus faced personal betrayal, ultimately death. Paul faced desertion. Timothy faced age discrimination. There's that one in the Bible. I bet you didn't know that was there. James faced the deaths of friends and companions. John faced religious persecution and on and on and on and on. God's story includes trials. If, if, someone, if someone prayed a prayer to give your life to Jesus and at the same time they said, you're about to have the best life you can imagine, sorry, they lied to you. The difference is not the absence of trials, it's, it's, it's what I know trials mean for me. That's the difference. Trials are now counted as joy in my life because I realize God can do something in me 
that's eternal through this hardship and this suffering. Are you seeing with me? Are you seeing this with me? So, number one, what is the first critical question about your life's direction? What story am I living? What gifts am I giving? Number three, what enemies am I, am I fighting? And number four, re what reward am I seeking? Go back one for me. What reward am I seeking? Number four, what reward am I seeking? You are pursuing some sort of reward for the life you're living. You better reflect on it. You're pursuing some sort of reward. Um, many of us, it's freedom. It's autonomy. I don't want to live, I mean, as soon as we get old enough, I don't want to live under my, my parents' rules, so I'm out of here. I mean, university, I don't want to live under university rules, I'm out of here. So we're, we're, we want self-government, right? We want to call the shots on our own life. The problem is, it's not going to take you long to figure out the shots you call aren't always the best ones. And guess who's to blame when that happens? So a, a life well lived, that direction based on your own self-rule is not a wise decision, right? We know that's not going to lead to life or human flourishing or the betterment of society. Everybody can't do that and it work. There's a better way to live. So you're looking for some sort of reward. Maybe your reward is pleasure. So you live for the weekend, right? Your, your, your job is, is literally all it is is to make income for Friday night, Saturday night, Sorry, couldn't make it to Sunday morning because Saturday night. You live for pleasure. That's, that's the reward you're seeking. Some of, some of you, it's financial well-being. So for you, it is, I'm going to sacrifice now so I can give into my pension later. I'm going to retire early, travel around, whatever it is. You have some sort of reward that your life is built around seeking. That's why getting intentional about, the dire uh, about your reward has, has so much to do with your direction in life. You've got to make sure, is the reward I'm after the one I should be after? The other reason is because of what we just talked about. Life and the pain of life can be so deep that if you don't have a reward that transcends the pain, you won't see a, way, you won't see a life worth living. You're going to be in the middle of pain wondering, what is this all for? What is this all about? There's going to be hopelessness associated with pain, not joy. We see that even in, in the life of God's people. Um, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 49 verse 4, he was talking to God about the fruit of his work. Now this is, this is Isaiah, a giant prophet in Israel's story. This is what he says to God. I replied, he replied to God. But my work seems so useless, he says to God. I've spent my strength for nothing and to no purpose. Jesus himself. Isaiah's work was fruitless. Jesus' work was rejected. Jesus said, Matthew 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Paul was deserted and left alone in his final book, 2 Timothy. He says, he says everyone has left me except one. Paul deserted and alone. Why, why didn't they give up? Why didn't they stop? Because they knew there was a reward. Ben, would you come up? Look at this. Look at this in Hebrews 12. They knew there was a reward. Hebrews 12 too. This is what the writer of Hebrews says is, is key to your life's direction. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, there's that word again, that was set before him, endured the cross... He despised its shame, and now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus was looking toward reward. Not only that, you and I can look toward reward. Look at this, Revelations 22, 12. This is Jesus speaking to you and me. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they've done. You know the promise of living God's story is a reward only heaven can give. That's the promise. That's the promise. That's what allowed people to push through the pain. That's what allowed people to push through the suffering. That's, that's what made people get intentional about their direction in life. Is because they knew there's something ahead of me 
that only heaven can give. Stand on your feet. Lisa, would you come?